Chief Judge Robert Hunsdell was born in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina on July 6, 1943, but grew up in Baltimore, where he attended Dunbar High School. In 1960, 12 Dunbar students entered the downtown restaurant where a few served. After refusing to leave, they were arrested and convicted of trespassing. As one of those students, Mr. Bell led an appeal of the verdict in a landmark civil rights case, Bell v. Maryland, which was argued before the United States Supreme Court and brought an end to the fact of racial segregation in Maryland. Judge Bell continued his education at Morgan State College in 1966 and received his J.D. from Harvard Law School in 1969. He came to the bench in 1975 as a judge of the District Court of Maryland, Baltimore City, and worked his way to become Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals, Maryland's highest court. In doing so, Robert M. Bell became the only active judge to have served uh, at least four years on all four levels of Maryland uh, judiciary, uh, and the, only uh, the first African-American to be named the first uh, the state's Chief Judge. Please welcome on Robert and Bill. Good morning. Good morning. Let me just, uh, is it Mitchell? Did I hear that right? Thank you for that very generous introduction. Uh, I always have trouble, quite frankly, when I'm introduced because I never know exactly what's going to be said and the more generous the introduction is, the, the more likely it is that I'll become full of myself. So what I do is I think about stories I've heard over time uh, to try to restrain that uh, impulse. <coughs> Today I was thinking about a story that was told by uh, Uncle Ben Hooks uh, when he was the head of the NAACP. It tells a story about a young man who was deathly ill the hospital and uh, on the day when his illness was most acute he needed a heart transplant on the day when his uh, uh, illness was most acute a plane crashed and in that plane there were three people who had a heart that was perfect for this young man an 85 year old judge 35 year old coach who remained in good condition and a an 18 year old after. Which heart do you want? The doctor asked him, and he said, without any hesitation at all, I'll take the judge's heart. Why? The doctor wanted to know. And he said, because that heart has never been used. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to dispel that rumor. Not all the judge's hearts have never been used. In fact, uh, you will find that judges are just like your parents and other people that you know. They do the best they can with what they have day in and day out. This is Black History Month. And I always come to it with this idea. I am sad that we have to celebrate Black History Month. I'm sad that we have to separate out a part of American history and give it special treatment. It reminds me to some extent of uh, what we outlawed in Brown and Gaines Boy, the separate but equal. You see, black history, African American history, is American history. No different no less. And the struggles of the African American people mirror, in many respects, <laughs> the struggles of the colonists who rebelled against the King of England. And the dreams that the African Americans have are, in many respects, the same dreams that propelled this country to rebel against England, or the colonies to rebel against England, and to form a country that we now enjoy today. That dream, of course, was of equality, a place where all persons had the same opportunity who worked hard and were willing to pay the price of success. African Americans brought to this 
country without, against their will, soon learn to dream that dream. So it is not true that Martin Luther King, the famous dreamer, was the first to have that dream. That is a dream that has persisted from the time that the first African slave arrived on these shores. It has continued in every one of them until emancipation was declared, and it continues today in the breast of every African American who sees injustice, and in fact, it is a dream that even exists in the hearts of all men and women who see inequality which still exists today. And until we get to the point where there is that more perfect union for which we always strive, I suspect that we're going to always have to pay special attention to special cases. And that, to me, is sad. But of course, I didn't come here to lecture you on such things. <clears throat> I came today to talk a bit about me and my history, my career. Now that's something that is a bit of a difficult, I find it somewhat difficult to talk about myself, uh, particularly in front of an audience and particularly when I'm saying nice things about myself. The reason is, of course, when I grew up, when one did that, it was called bragging. And of course, I don't want to do that. However, I suspect that uh, since I accepted the invitation to come today, I'm going to have to put aside my fear of being seen as a braggart and talk to you a bit about how I came to be where I am. <coughs> and also, I think, in the process, talk a bit about the impact of the law and its role in larger respects and in larger efforts to improve society has had on me. You need to know that I grew up in East Baltimore during the time of segregation. And as with most of us, the first major influence on me was my parents. In my case, my mother, because my mother and father separated when I was a young youngster. I've been here since I was a year and a half. My mother grew up on a farm in North Carolina. She had very little formal education had a strong work ethic and an iron determination. That determination was that her children would fare better than she did. That they would have opportunities she did not have and that they would be in a position to make something, as she said, of themselves. So she never faltered in insisting that we get an education the education that she was denied. Why was she denied the education? She was a part of a sharecropping family, which meant that they went to school when it was convenient for the farm. They did not go to school at their convenience. So she never faltered insisting that we get the education she was denied. And despite the obvious injustices associated with that period in our history, both within and outside the law, there were also certain benefits. In those days, I grew up in East Baltimore. Baltimore was a community in the real sense of the word. Unlike today, East Baltimore's African-American community included the middle class and the well-to-do, along with those of us who had limited economic resources. There were doctors, lawyers, ministers, teachers. They all lived and interacted with each other on a daily basis. In those days as well, the community functioned as an extended family. 
instead of calling in the law, anyone who saw a youngster doing something wrong would not hesitate to pull that youngster up for it. And if the occasion demanded, apply corporal punishment. On the other hand, if anyone saw something good happening, or something good happened in their family, the whole community was aware of it, and they rejoiced in it. Our teachers were on a mission. They knew that in a segregated society, we would have to run twice as hard to prove ourselves. They set very high expectations and standards for us to meet. At that time, many of our primary and secondary teachers, believe it or not, held PhDs. They pushed for excellence. They strove to mold our minds to inspire us to emulate heroes like W.E.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, Marion Anderson, or Ralph Wood Bunch, and of course the namesake of my high school, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. They were proud to have the opportunity to provide meaningful opportunities for young people with potential. And they believed we all had potential. We weren't taught by rote. Our teachers taught us to become independent thinkers. The lawyers in our community were particularly impressive, and they were also influential. People like Clarence Mitchell III and Juanita Jackson Mitchell and Rob Watson, John Hargrove Har and Harry Cole, all were very active in the community. All were very acutely aware that they were fighting for injustice, and that they wanted to help open the way for others to move forward. In that group, Harry Cole became my predecessor on the Court of Appeals first African-American so served. John Hargrove was the first African-American to be the United States, uh, Deputy United States Attorney in a time when the society was thoroughly segregated. We all know about Clarence Mitchell III, the 101st Senator of the United States, and Martin Jackson Mitchell was the first black woman to practice law in this state. Our ministers were activists as well. They put themselves on the front lines in the civil rights struggle. We had, in a sense, a powerful sense of ourselves as we were standing on the shoulders of those who came before us. And we had an awareness of ourselves as part <coughs> of a continuum. We felt a responsibility to achieve beyond that, beyond those that came before us to open the way so that those coming behind us could go on even further. One of my classmates at Dunbar, Reginald Lewis, who as many of you may know, became the founder of Beatrice Foods and opened the way for many black entrepreneurs, was the vice president of the city student council. We ran together on the same ticket, I was the president. Reggie said he was going to be successful. He got me involved in money-making schemes early on, like hawking sodas at the stadium. He was successful, I was not. See, he told me to go and sign up, but he didn't tell me how to sign up, and so I worked all day and didn't get paid. He did. I'd always wanted to be a lawyer. Not a business. Their good Marshall was and still is one of my heroes. And oddly enough, one of the actions that I took as a high school student brought me into contact, although not directly, with that great man. You've heard that in 1960, when I was in high school, I was involved in a sit-in demonstration. It was perfectly natural for me to say yes when Morgan University students, Morgan College in those days, asked me as student government president to recruit fellow student Dunbar students to demonstrate against segregation. Morgan supplied the bus, and 
we picketed at various places downtown. Let me tell you, it was a frightening experience. In the picketing aspect or portion of our uh, demonstration, we were counterpicked by protesters on the other side who did not appreciate our picketing their stores. We were confronted by angry counter-protesters shouting obscenities. I saw at that time the ugliness of blind hatred that I heard so much about. It. But it was the first time I came first face to face with it. it scared me, it scared us. But somehow it also strengthened our resolve. The Civil Rights Movement, it has been said, was started in Greensboro, North Carolina, in April. And that we started, we, we followed after Greensboro. Morgan State College had for 10 years before 1960 been engaged in trying to desegregate places of public accommodation, department stores, and the like. And the march that they had planned for June of 1960 had nothing to do with Greensboro, North Carolina. It had been planned the year before. So Morgan was involved by itself as a separate entity in trying to do the desegregation of public accommodations places. And I was privileged to have been given the opportunity to participate. The question is, how did we get into this? As I've told you, we were downtown picketing restaurants. We've been there for about an hour. Every store for two blocks had closed their doors because they knew we were there and we were going to come in. Every store that is, every restaurant that is, except one, Hooper's did not close. And we were able to go into Hooper's restaurant, sit down, and demand service. And of course, the rest is history. I was arrested, tried as an adult, and convicted of trespass. The law had a major impact on me right there. My conviction was upheld by the Maryland Court of Appeals, the court that I once led. It was only overturned after the United States Supreme Court remanded the case to the Maryland Court of Appeals with instructions to review it in light of changed circumstances. Between the conviction and the appeal, Maryland had passed a new Public Accommodations Act. Baltimore City had passed an accommodations, a public accommodations ordinance. There was a 16-year-old defendant, a civil disobedience case watching a legal battle unfold involving extraordinary lawyers. I mentioned that I was brought into contact, although not directly, with Thurgood Marshall. He was one of the lawyers. <coughs> signed on to the case at some point before he was appointed to the Second Circuit. <coughs> there was on the other side of the case, representing the state of Maryland, a lawyer named Robert Charles Murphy. Robert Charles Murphy would one day become chief judge of the Maryland Court of Appeals. No one would have guessed at that time that Robert Charles Murphy and I go on to sit on the same Court of Appeals together for a number of years before I would replace him as Chief Judge. <coughs> it is said that <coughs> truth is stranger than fiction, and I guess that's right. After Dunbar, I went on to Morgan State College, but was forced to drop out after my first semester when I was hospitalized for a year with tuberculosis. <coughs> During that year, uh, a Mr. Fisher, history professor, thought he saw something in me and he took the time to bring me my studies at the hospital, keep me going while I was there. 
he was one of the smartest men I knew I've ever seen. He didn't have a PhD, but he did have a commitment to young people and to the goal of seeing that society became a place where people were treated equally, no matter their color or any other aspect of their being. I've also had great fortune to cross paths with many other great men. When I was at Morgan, studying at home, preparing to apply for law school, a man knocked on the door along with his wife, Christine, and asked that I vote for him for the House of Delegates. That man was Paul Sarbanes. He was going door to door campaigning. And once he found out that I was interested in law school, he sat on the steps and took the time to encourage me to go to law school. But not just go to any law school, but go to law school where he went to law school at Harvard. When I was at Harvard, I continued to be active in the civil rights movement, and I'm proud to have recruited Derek Bell, who was the first African-American tenured professor at Harvard Law School. After Harvard, I came back to Baltimore to be a lawyer at Piper and Marvin, to find Baltimore Law Firm. There, too, I was fortunate to have a mentor, Jack Jones, who encouraged me to do what I wanted, to work hard and to play hard. At that time, there were very few black judges and few prospects to become judges. I didn't want to be a judge initially, but because I had the background to make the list in order to become a judge, in those days, you had to apply to a commission. And the commission determined whether you were going to even have an opportunity to become a judge. So I could make the list. I did make the list. And so I was urged to apply for a judgeship and to serve in the interest of the African American community. I'm glad I did. I found that it was good work. But more importantly, I found it was valuable work. Some of you may have, well, if you Googled me, you probably seen some of the old pictures where I had long hair and goatee. And I dressed in those days, I suppose about as outlandishly as I do today. But no one, what I believe and still believe that it's very important for judges to approach problems with sensitivity and an open mind. I believe that every ruling must be entirely supportable under the law. I started in the district court. In those days, we heard our cases in police stations. We were moved around the state. One year, I was assigned to hear cases in Ocean City during the summer. That was a kind of a reward. If you could go down, hear the cases, and then spend some time at the beach. I had difficulty when I went to Ocean City convincing those police officers that I was a judge. I was even given a ticket for parking in the judge's parking space. Yeah, I made rulings that were unpopular with some police officers. I made controversial rulings, or at least what some people consider to be controversial rulings. But as I've said, the rulings may be controversial, but they must also be supportable by the law. I enjoyed being on the district. I still think that it is the most important of the courts in terms of the effect that it has on people's lives. I didn't want to go to the circuit court particularly, but again, I was pressured to move up for the good of the community, so I did. While the pressure to advance and much of my sense of responsibility are connected to the African American community, I've always done my best to serve the entire community and to apply the law in as colorblind a fashion and fair manner as possible. 
Now let me not give you a blow-by-blow -blow account of my the rest of my career as a judge. Suffice it to say that I've had to deal with many painful situations, but I've also had the privilege of being the face and the voice of the Maryland <coughs> As Chief Judge, my responsibilities were to be the administrative head of the court system, the entire court system, to determine the budget for the court system. And I had the opportunity to attempt to put into place initiatives that would improve the court system and its service to its citizens, to the citizens each service. In that regard, I'll just mention two things. The first thing that I, I'll mention is that we were very much <coughs> concerned about access to justice. Everything that we did was designed to provide better access to the court. The truth is, people are more likely to have faith and confidence in the court system if, it believe, if they believe they have access to that system. And keep in mind, access is important because if you think about the three branches of government, the judiciary is the only one that does not have any tangible power. The governor has the power of the sword, the military, the police, executive department, <coughs> That's because the responsibility is to execute the law. The legislature has the power of the court, a first. That is to say, it determines what the budget for each of the branches and all of the departments of government will be. It is it which <coughs> decides, in that sense, what all the other branches can do. That is a very real power. The judiciary has no real power. It has good judgment. And it has to exercise that good judgment so as to enhance the trust and the confidence of the people. For it is the trust and the confidence of the people that is the only power that the judiciary has. So says Alexander Hamilton in the Federalist Papers. So says my hero, Thurgood Marshall. So we were involved in trying to provide full and fair access to justice for everyone. For that reason, we put into place a public information office to apprise people of what was going on in the court, in the judiciary. We developed a, an alternative dispute resolution office to provide access to the courts indirectly by providing the means by which people could seek to empower themselves and resolve their own disputes. We have an access to justice commission to which problems with access can be brought. And there will be people and there are people, judges and other partners in the justice system who will be working toward ensuring that something is done about the problems that have been brought to the attention of the court. And the other thing that I, I will mention is that access to justice is a big thing, but the, the other thing that I will mention is that we have been uh, engaged uh, consistently in trying to effectively approach case management by in putting into place a case management system that joins together all jurisdictions in the state. Appellate courts, circuit courts, district courts, so that they are able to talk to each other, they communicate with each other, and one can look at one screen and determine the entire history of a particular case. That's something that has been eluding us because we have in Maryland 
two separate appellate courts, of course, 12 district courts, and 24 circuit courts. And they all have different systems of communication. We tried to put together one case management system so that all of those uh, courts can talk to each other and can communicate in such a way as to be able to allow a citizen law on and find out where that particular case stands at any point, particular point in time. Now, I was told, well, uh, am I on? I'm okay? 1105? It is 1105. How about <laughs> a little bit more? Well, I, I, I'm trying to follow you, Art. I'm just trying to. <laughs> How are you enjoying your retirement? Oh, going to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I am. Uh, let me uh, tell you about, about retirement. <clears throat> Those of you who may, who, you may not know, in Maryland, we have a mandatory retirement system. The federal system, of course, as you know, allows a judge to serve for life with good behavior. Maryland says 70 years old is enough, and a lot of other state courts do the same, although the age limit differs. Uh, I'm often asked, what do I think about mandatory retirement? And my answer is, I'm in all in favor of it. I think it is important that you serve your time you make your contribution, but you move aside and allow younger people to move in and make their contribution. I've learned that how, however smart you are, however committed you are, at some point, your intelligence, your commitment, will not equal the intelligence and commitment or the open-mindedness, maybe is a better way to put it of younger people who are approaching the problem fresh. And so you ought to then move aside. I'm much in favor of it, and I think that the citizens of Maryland were very intelligent in its decision-making when in 1994, it was given the opportunity to change the system and allow the judges to serve at the second time. <coughs> And almost two to one, citizens said no. I applaud that. And so when you ask me how am I enjoying it, I am enjoying it. And I'm looking forward to enjoying it even more as time passes. The only thing I want to do is sit back one day and perhaps write a book about my experiences in the law uh, so that young people coming up will have the benefit of my experiences and will not have to themselves read them. That would be wonderful. We look forward to reading it. Thank you so much. For it.